Welcome to Real BMX Racing the Podcast. Today's guest is USA BMX Pro Cameron Larson. Welcome to the show. No, we want to take it back to the beginning, man, like of this whole journey, bro. We want to know like what inspired you to start racing BMX? How did you start? Where did you start? Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm originally from Bakersfield, California. Um, my two local tracks were Metro BMX, where they still have a national to this day. And then we had another track called Bakersfield BMX. Um, that was off one of the freeways. Um, and yeah, basically I, uh, got into racing from just my family. Uh, my mom and my uncle did it, uh, through really? my grandparents. So, um, yeah, I think when I was just younger, um, Christmas time, I think I got a bike when I was around five and, um, yeah, the, the next step for us was to go out to the track after I got off of training wheels and just kind of see how I liked it. And the story kind of goes for me that I was really scared to get in the gate and was intimidated by the gate. Didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. But um, after I took my first lap, uh, evidently I, I didn't want to stop. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I guess I was going to ask, so what was, do you remember what your first bike was? Um, I'm not sure the brand, but I know it was silver. Um, and I, and my favorite color was blue. So I'm pretty sure I had like a blue, I think the brand was ATI number plate at the time. Um, and yeah, I ended up being number 128, which, um, my birthday is October 28th. So it was 1028. So I'm not sure if it just ended up being like that or right, if right. it was like kind of like a, an ironic scenario, but I, I remember my first number and I remember what my first bike looked like, but I'm not sure the brand. So since you started so early, man, when did you become expert? Yeah, so uh started at five, and I believe I turned expert around seven. Um, wow. And, man, I, I struggled a lot <laughs> in that transition, but, yeah, I'm sure we can get into that. I was going to say, yeah, that's what, that's what we're here for because, you know, sometimes the kids, they go expert, and they feel like they need to come out there and win everything like they, they did to get there. And when they find out that it's not that easy, that's usually when they decide whether or not it's either a breaking point or they muster through and figure out, all right, so now what do I got to do to get to where I need to be, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, of course, um, when I was younger, um, and I think around that 7, 8 range, you know, I always wanted to go to the Nationals and win the big trophies because that's what they were at the time, other plaques. Um, and, yeah, I remember – I don't, like, vivid really remember everything to the point, but I know that from around 7 to 9, I struggled a lot in expert – you know, not really making too many main events, maybe was state top 10, state around state seven, state 10. So locally, I think um, I could kind of hold my own, but I had local riders that were co continuously competing with me, like getting first some nights, sometimes thirds. I remember um, there was a specific kid that like I would always get passed by at the line. Um, and my dad would be super, super upset with me, of course. Those, 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 those uh, drives on the way home suck. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, and then fast forwarding a little bit, uh, at nine years old, I, or at eight years old, I went to my first grands. Um, wow. and that was a, a big eye opener. I, I got smoked. Um, and obviously <laughs> learned a lot and kind of saw what the first, or I guess that was my first, um, experience of kind of how big the sport actually was, you know, mm -hmm. in our little world, I, I never raced those kids didn't know, you know, at that age, it's still, you're still, uh, kind of Jersey reading of like, Oh, who's this guy? Who's that guy? And some people I thought maybe I could beat and I got smoked by. Um, and so, yeah, around nine years old, I think I started winning a few nationals, maybe not those stacked races, but maybe if we went to Arizona or maybe I had a local race in Bakersfield, I did pretty well at. Um, and yeah, I think it took to me about, two and a half years to get kind of in the mix. And then from nine to probably 13 ish, I was consistently top 10 in the nag. And then I kind of had a fall off and then came back up. So. So when those early years between seven and nine, did, was there ever a time where you just wanted to give up? You were like, I can't do this um, anymore, man. It's too hard. And what kept you that, going? Yeah. Yeah. So I think at, the, at that age, um, it's still fresh enough. Um, and I was doing other sports. I was playing baseball still. Um, I was riding uh, dirt bikes and I was racing. So I think at that time, I probably wanted to stop because I was tired of getting yelled at <laughs> by my parents. But I don't <laughs> think that I was old enough yet to kind of understand really what I was doing anyways. It was kind of just like plug and play. Like no matter what on 
Mondays we were going to the track. Fridays we we're going to the track. More of like giving getting me out of the house, giving me something to do. Um, I think we're, which like I said, we can get into. Um, when I was about thirteen, I were kind of, I I, I actually did quit. I quit for two years um, oh, wow. because yeah, yeah, and and a lot of it had to do with some family stuff going on, which I'm I'm cool to talk about as well. But a lot of it was that I'm I'm really short for the normal kind of, I guess. BMX build and I just I didn't grow and I wasn't strong enough and so I was just getting my teeth kicked in week in and week out and I kind of got over it and yeah that that, that I, I I guess to answer your question I I did quit before but then I had to build myself back and come back so there we go so how tall are you and how much do you weigh I'm just curious because I'm a small guy also and I'm trying to overcome racing some of the bigger guys yeah so I'm a five eight on a good day and i weigh uh, like i'm just now getting to like 160 pounds so but growing up in in that in this time period that we're talking about like 13 to 15 some kids were already growing and had mustaches and they looked like sean day <laughs> at 15, you know and, and now i'm just this puny kid i think i was like 410 until i was a freshman in high school so i mean i was to, to kind of put it into perspective i was like probably 410 411 and these kids were already like five four ish um and so yeah it, it was tough And what helped you like training to get faster at that size? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, at, at, at that age, like we obviously didn't really know anything as a family and I'm kind of like a, I guess a first generation person in my family to kind of take it to that more extreme level. Cause like I said, my, my mother and my uncle did race, but it was kind of just like the local didn't really get to many nationals and stuff. So obviously we're, I'm sure my dad was learning from other dads. We were doing a lot of sprints. We were throwing on ankle weights onto our bikes before the primal seat post was cool. I don't know if you guys know what the primal seat post is, but that was in for a little bit where there's like a super heavy seat post. Um, and just, yeah, just, just trying to figure it out, doing everything, doing grass sprints. Um, my dad would take me out to an actual track and field track and make me do full laps on that. Just kind of anything to, to at least feel like we were pushing, right? I don't think we really knew what we were doing, but at the time it was just kind of building that discipline and that kind of work ethic, I think, so. Wow. And knowing you had to do something, right? So, right. so your, mo your mom and your uncle were kind of your, like your coaches in the beginning? Uh, I wouldn't say my coaches, but that's how they got, they got into it. Um, I had a kind of a stepdad through a marriage that was kind of the big enforcer on my training. Um, and he had like a little bit of a football background. Um, and by that, I kind of mean just that, that brute, almost an intimidation type of thing to just make me want to get up and go do it. Um, you know, some, some people have it, some people don't, and that's kind of <laughs> what he would drill into me. Um, and, and unfortunately, and fortunately, like it, it was tough, but I think, um, you know, looking back at it now, I'm, I'm very thankful for that kind of coaching, I guess, even though it's not a hundred percent, uh, the right way to do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how old are you now? I just turned 24 in October. Okay, okay. So with that being said, how do you manage to have your personal life and your BMX life? How hard is it to separate the two? Yeah, um, so I, I would say fortunately and unfortunately, um, some injuries have been a key factor in kind of my perspective on everything. Um, so rewinding a little bit, I um, when I came back to racing at like 16, um, you know, I was still in high school and kind of just like kind of doing it on and off, but it gave me an opportunity to realize kind of what I wanted in the sport and what I didn't want. Um, and I knew I had to work hard. And so what I did that people can learn from, for me is from 16 to like 18, I went full throttle, full gas all in. Um, and while I progressed really well, um, I ran into some injuries and it ultimately broke me down pretty bad mentally because all I knew at 17, 18 years old was BMX racing and, you know, BMX racing was my life and whatever result on the weekend was how I, you know, was that next week. You know, if I had a bad race, I'm all upset and I wouldn't use the word depressed, but you know, just down and upset. But then if I won the next race, then all of a sudden my life's good again. Um, and so, yeah, it honestly took some, some injuries and kind of, um, yeah, some soul searching to find that balance. And now I kind of feel like what led me to where I'm at now and how I'm able to balance my life now is just kind of having that perspective, right? Like 
you know, I, I wake up every day and I train and I know what I'm going for. But at the same time, I understand how important it is to have some type of life outside of racing to kind of keep a long career going. Right. Because, right. you know, I, I, and, I, and I guess another thing is, you know, different people have different goals. You know, some people would rather get in the sport, hit it out for, you know, four or five years really hard and then dip out. And some people, you know, want to have a good long pro career. And so I know also a lot of people who kicked my butt on the way up, but don't race anymore. And whether it's because they wanted to or not, they, they probably hit that burnout point. So the injuries you're speaking of, did they come from racing bikes or motocross or? That's yeah. Thing? Yeah. Yeah. So I had a string of injuries um, specifically in 2018, or I, I, I guess I should rephrase this growing up in BMX. The only thing I ever broke were my wrists like all the time. And so like, <laughs> while they were injuries, but like I would still race with my cast on because that was just kind of what you did. Like if you could grip your hands, you know, take my cast into the, the doctor's office and see if it can mold around my thing, even if it was just for sprints or something, because like I said, at, at that time, that's all that mattered to me. Um, and so I broke wrist growing up, but then when I got a little older, so like 18, 19, um, I did a wrist, but then I did a collarbone like, so in, like in three years, sorry, I'm going all, the, all over the place, but in three years I did a wrist, a collarbone, and then I had a really bad wrist injury, which, um, had it made me get a complete wrist reconstruction. Oh. Um, and that thing went from like, you know, when you're breaking little bones here and there, it's probably like a six, maybe eight week max type of thing. Well, the wrist reconstruction took me eight months. Um, nice. and so, yeah, that was, that was a big big kind of window to miss where you know at that time I hadn't dealt with anything that significant so for me it was always when's the next time I'm gonna get back on the bike when's the next time I'm gonna get back on the bike and that injury so happened to be like when am I gonna be able to turn a door handle you know to to, to open up the front door you know so that kind of all hit me at once but I guess coming back to your question yeah most or all of the injuries have just been from racing and do you ever fully overcome an injury like mentally uh, I would say you can get to that point, but I think no matter what, it, it's always going to be there, right? Like, so now um, I'm completely mentally over my injuries. Like, I'm not too worried about if I crash on this or if I do that anymore, but definitely some things hurt more than others as time go on. So I, I don't forget them. <laughs> right, right. Oh, we, me and Shannon were talking about the other day. It's like certain riders, when they're they're really, really fast until they have that one big crash, and they're still fast after, but you can tell there's just something different about how when they come back, you're like, mm, they're not as aggressive as they were. <laughs> right, yeah. That, yeah, that's definitely true. And and honestly, that I think also, like I said, led, or led me to having balance in my life because before then I was what I felt like insto- unstoppable. And then, yeah, right. once, that, once that big one hits you, then it, it kind of challenges your character a bit and makes you kind of rethink some things. You know, now you might think more, a little more, more, you know, before you get into the gate, you know, before that injury or whatever. Yep. <laughs> so, so what does an average day in your life look like? Yeah. So fortunately, um, I'm right now I'm able to do, um, BMX full time. So right now it's just training. So normally I wake up, I have two training sessions a day, whether that be the gym or the sprints or, um, being at the track. Um, and so I live in Oldsmar, Florida now, so we're about five minutes away from the track. So we'll get up, have a breakfast. Um, we have a pretty good crew that goes and rides. So we ride like 10 to two, um, typically, which some sessions are gate specific. Some are doing full laps. Others are doing just little short stints of the track. Um, and then I'll have a lunch. And then normally in the afternoon, I have some type of either recovery or another training session that I do. Um, and then some of that is doing video review or just, you know, trying to recover or kind of do that. So I've been, um, I used to do school. I graduated a few years ago, so I used to have school into that program, but since 2022, 21, I've kind of just been stock full-time BMX. So it's been really nice. So do you prefer to train with other people? Like as far as, you know, opposed to going to the track by yourself? Yeah, I think um, there's pros and cons to both. I've done both of them um, because when I lived in Bakersfield, I had a smaller local scene, so I would kind of ride by myself anyways. And I think um, I like them both. I think circumstantially, the more riders and the more competition 
helps you. But I do think there are also instances where riding on your own is beneficial because you can kind of focus in and lock in on just yourself and worry about yourself and not have to worry about all of the outside factors. Okay. Um, what's your setup now that you're riding with? Uh, so I'm going to be able to announce when I'm riding. Uh, um, <laughs> I almost had it, Shannon. I'll be able to announce what I'm riding on, on uh, Friday. So a week from today, oh, wow. but um, I'll tell you, it's an aluminum frame. Um, it's been around for a while. So, uh, okay. but if you want to know specs, I can let you know specs, but I, uh, I, I can't disclose the information yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me know if you, let me know a few of the specs. I always ask like, what size cranks are you running? Uh, I run 175s. And what size bars? Uh, bars, I run seven and a half. Um, but I just changed. So like, even though I didn't grow, I, I used to run a taller setup than I do now. So I went from eight bars. Um, and yeah, now I'm on seven and a half bars. All right. And as far have... as, okay. let me, let me just ask you this quick question. I mean, are you familiar with parts and brands and what's the big difference between like, just say a pair of Shimano DX, DXRs and like the Behringer cranks that are out that a lot of people I see are popping on their bikes now. Is there like uh-huh. any difference in cranks? Does that make any difference? Like, oh, my God, you know, I've seen people switch from Shimano DXRs to Behringer's because they say they stiffer. No other, <laughs> Not because of color, and I can understand that, maybe more than, like, you know, the stiffness. I'm like, oh, the st- DXRs aren't stiff enough? Right. So, um, truthfully, I do feel differences in different brands and different products. But between those two cranks, I think that the Behringer's are lighter, um, mm-hmm. and whereas the DXRs may be a little bit heavier. But um, – to be completely honest, other than maybe the Q factor, so like how far the crank actually bends. So like traditionally and, and almost every other crank other than a Behringer crank has a little bit of bow, if that makes sense. Like like it kind of has a little bit, which I'm sure it's designed that way. And I think the Behringer is a little more straight. So I think technically mm. straighter would be better power transfer maybe. But I'll tell you that I rode three different types of Promax cranks this year, carbon, HF2 and HF3, and I interchanged them throughout the whole year, and I couldn't really, couldn't really tell you a huge difference other than maybe that first, you know, two laps around the track. So why I mean, did so, you? Why was it? Why did you switch out on the cranks? Is it because you were burning through them, or no? I was testing a lot of things. So okay. when I was um, with like the World Cups and the Pan Am Games and stuff, we just are testing stuff all the time. So like I try like a super super light bike setup what was like carbon rims forks cranks you know bars all that and then kind of kind of was just trying to figure out what recipe was going to you know work with me the best so but pro max just made three different types of cranks so it was, it was honestly really nice did you find that a lighter setup was faster for you being being smaller yeah so and that's where i'm kind of in a good position right now is so i did find that the lighter setup is faster out of the gate. Um, but it's also less, um, comfortable around the track, especially if it's windy. So like a place maybe like Reno or somewhere or a smaller hill, I think a lighter bike is going to, you know, be better. But when you're talking about a super cross hill with all the G forces and a place that I really lack on is the weight, you know, pushing those backsides and gating speed on the big tracks, Mm -hmm. a heavier setup actually suits me a little bit more because, it's helping me kind of gain more speed around the track. Whereas if I have the light bike, it might get me out of the gate and down the, you know, the hill really well, but I might hit some headwind in my away 160 pounds. <laughs> I'm just going to get blown away versus if I'm right racing with someone like Nick human, who's, you know, six, three, six, four and weighs 200 pounds. Like I, I stand no chance if I'm not on a little bit heavier equipment. Okay. So okay. let me ask you, so you were on a carbon frame before, correct? Yeah, correct. And so when's yeah. the last time you were on an aluminum frame? And did you ride the aluminum frame that you're going to be riding now? Do you have the setup already? Or? Um, so I do have, I got my uh, bikes right after the Grand. So I've been on them now for a couple of weeks. Um, I haven't ridden an aluminum frame since 2016. So I rode um, the aluminum frame I'm referring to is the first generation Rift. I rode. 
Okay. Um, and then I got on Taharos for a couple of years after that. And then I went to Supercross and then I went back on Haros. So I've literally been on carbon for the past like six to eight years. So I definitely um, was a little nervous with the change, but um, yeah, so far so good. So it's been good. I'm asking that because I've seen some of you guys like at, on the gate and just like just just putting your um a little bit of pressure on the forward pedal and I see the whole flame frame flexing the carbon. Right. I mean, you just of course you don't see that, and I'm just wondering how you would feel like being on an aluminum frame after being on a carbon frame so long. You, like you have no problem with that? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, it took me so so very fortunate. This brand was able to make me a spec bike that I wanted to, to mimic. So I made it as close to my previous setup as I could. Um, and the only real awesome. area that I felt difference was out of the gate, but I think a lot of it was the bottom bracket height and maybe not. So the stiffness, because although maybe carbon has different flex, it still does have some flex. So I think any bike is going to, you know, like I said, twitch a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really see as a dramatic difference as I thought I would, but I will say that it did take me like two or three track sessions to really feel like, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm back. You know, the first couple I was like, ah, I don't know. About this. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, have, I've been riding the same Haro frame um, specs for the last four years almost. So it, it was, it was going to, it was whatever frame I went to, even if it was, gonna be like a prophecy or something which it's not um i feel like would have felt different you know anyways right i mean would companies make a one-off carbon frame for their riders to you know just if you like required one and like i can't do this bro like i gotta ride <laughs> carbon you know would they uh i think i think if if the return on investment was big enough but i'm not sure that we have <laughs> athletes that are doing that quite yet hopefully in the future they would i mean i've heard the stories of people getting to ride or whatever bike that they want. And then they just put the, the decals or whatever the sponsor is. And they're just like, yeah, let's we'll go ahead and run it that way. You know, obviously we're not close enough to actually see what like, Oh, that's not that kind of bike. Yeah. But I've also been on the other side where that was a big deal. <laughs> oh, so. Yeah. yeah. For brands, you would think it is a big deal, you know, especially when, when somebody gets a close up, bro, and throws it all the way Instagram or something. Yeah, you know? does it clo throws a close up and then they see a sticker and then you get a couple of comments that are like, hey, that's not what that is. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. and then you get a phone call. Yeah. 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 What, what was your um aha moment when you knew that you made it? I still uh I still don't really feel that way. Um but I, I think there's three or there's been three uh pivotal moments kind of in my career that proved to myself that I could make it, if that makes sense. Um, so when I, 2021 Grands, um, I got second and I had won one of the mains and that was kind of my first real feeling of like running the top pace with Joris. Like I was battling with Joris and Corbin at the time in 2021. Um, and like growing up, you know, those are the guys that I, you know, looked up to and always race. And I feel like every athlete that is kind of getting into that crest has that um, kind of mental space to where like they go from the, I mean, it's cliche. You, they go from your idols to your rivals, but I feel like you actually have to actually believe that they're your rivals. I think that's easy to say like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, now I'm racing these guys. So now I'm their competition, but I think it takes one race or one season or something for you to really be like, okay, like now I'm getting in the gate and I don't care if I hear, Corbett. like now it's no longer cool to hear their name in the gate you know what I mean now they're just another name and I, and I do think that's a process I think no matter how strong mentally you feel like you are I still do think that everybody kind of goes through that mm -hmm. um and then truthfully like I I struggled kind of up and down kind of been on a, on a good little wave but I think this year obviously was a, a pretty big breakthrough year for me um you know and and the the Pan American Games was a really big um milestone for me to kind of re-believe in myself because I think that just like everything in life or in work or in sport you're kind of on this upward trajectory but you're always dealing with challenges right so like at first it's like be you know the best novice then it's be the best intermediate and you know you know you know what I'm kind of getting to but when you get into pro or elite racing like now that there's not a pro anymore like you become 
a moto fill guy. Then you get into the main events, you know, then you're kind of in that fourth through six and you're just grinding for that podium, grinding for that podium. Well, then you get the podium, then you're trying to become a winner. And I hadn't really had a big kind of international stage win um, until this year. And I, I was able to win the Pan American championship, which is kind of a little more under the blanket that was um, earlier this year, but it was a continental championship. And then, yeah, the Pan Am games, when I finally, or when I won it, I kind of finally was able to hit a little bit of a debrief moment where I'm like, okay, like I proved it to myself finally that I can come through when it matters, when it's crunch time. Oh no. He'll be back. I lost you. There we go. Can you see me? Yeah. 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 But yeah, I, I would just say that the, the Pan Ams this year was kind of the, the moment to me where I, kind of re-believed in myself and kind of can now set my sights now. I'm not really chasing that next win. Now I'm just chasing, you know, the self-improvement and, and I don't have any more doubt, you know, in my mind. So, okay. yeah, I think I think this year was the, the big step. So yeah, let me ask you, when, oh, yeah. When you became <laughs> pro, when you, <laughs> when you became pro, how were you accepted, like, by the other pros? Like, that's been pros for the last couple of years. Are they like really yeah. cool? Like, oh, what's up, Cam? We like waiting for you, bro. And or are they like, yo, don't talk to me. Like, you didn't earn the right to talk to me yet, you know? Or is it yeah. a little of both? Yeah, I think I was still fortunate enough. So when I turned pro, I there was still a pro. Um, and so when I turned a pro, a lot of people turned a pro at the same time. So we were kind of all just newbies. Um, okay. But then for sure, when I went from a pro to elite, there is kind of that like. I wouldn't even say disrespect, but until you show that you're competitive, I feel like some people won't give you the time of day. Um, and then once you're competitive or once you kind of, and it sounds super weird, but once you kind of get that one result or that one little sliver of like, okay, like this guy's serious. Then, then I started getting a couple more high fives or how's the day going. But, but when I was younger, you know, 18, 19, 20, you know, I was getting up there with my, you know, I'm just, uh, just, you know, little, little, little fish, big pond type type thing for sure. But I wouldn't say anybody was really disrespectful to me. I just feel like maybe some people wouldn't give me the time of day, which is completely okay because, um, you know, that's just how sport is kind of competition. Right. And is it the same when you leave the States with like, uh, international riders? Yeah, or they for like, sure. Or they, do they welcome you like, Oh my God, guys from the States, bro. Come on, man. Hang with us. No, and no, it's it's kind of that same thing. Like you almost need a result or some kind of aha moment for them to be like, "Oh, cool! Like, how's it going? Yeah, yeah. I see you've been killing it. Cool." But until you break that, what I don't even know what kind of barrier it is. But until you get to where you're of topic, it's it's pretty hard to you know to fit in. But at the same time, you know, fitting in isn't really the goal. You know, it's it's to race your bike. So, where's the um? Where's the weirdest place somebody's recognized you? weirdest place um <laughs> honestly well, most people say most people say airports airports yeah i mean i wouldn't say it's it's that um big for us but i'll say like the coolest place has been going to some of those smaller south american countries um because i think their fan base is so big and genuine and loyal um to whoever they are whether it's mariana or carlos or whatever and so um you know, after winning a few races or just being maybe a little bit well, more well known in the BMX space, the going to those countries is always super cool because you do feel a little bit like a, a rock star. And whether it's for <laughs> me personally or just any pro BMX racer in general, like they're right. trying to get everybody's autograph, they're trying to get everybody's picture, you know, because we're American, we're a little bit more sought after. So they're trying to get anything with a, an American's <laughs> glove or American's goggle lens, American's number plate, like anything. So I don't say, I don't think any like places that have been like weird to me where I haven't expected it um, have happened yet, but I would say the coolest place is South America for sure. Have you ever been to a place like uh, with your group friends with the bikes and like a little nervous of the area that you were in? Like a little yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So uh, my roommate and I actually went to the, the Continental Champs were in Ecuador. Um, and in this certain area, it was the, the city name was Rio Bamba. And it was very, um, I don't want to disrespect anyone, but it was, I, I wasn't very comfortable. Um, so I was trying and, to be careful of how I worded it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. It was, it was, it was um, one of those experiences where 
when I left, I was happy that we were all safe and like I could care less about how the race went. It was like, okay, we're here. It was super cool to see this. Cool. <laughs> Let's get out of here as fast as we can. Um, but again, that that's part of the journey. And right. I think that like, again, those fans, and that's actually what I was referring to, like those people that were all there at the race, super respectful, super cool, full of energy. And those are like some of the kids I feel like appreciate BMX the most because they maybe aren't as fortunate as we are in America and get to see all the, you know, cool races and the big races. Like they were just so welcoming and so, you know, excited just to have people like there's people hanging off the side of their houses, you know, waving their shirts over to watch the race because they weren't in the actual facility. They were just, you know, standby watching and stuff. And like, you know, everybody was really excited in that country. So. Do they, um, so those, those events, they charge people to go into those things or is it free? No, uh, the, that race I think in particular was free. Okay. Like the world cups and stuff. I think you have to pay something, but it's not too, too expensive. Um, but most of the other races other than the world cups are pretty much like in the States where it's free spectators. Do you have any harvest stories while traveling to a race? Like through like maybe losing your bike in an airport or getting to a car crash or something like on the way to a big uh, race? No, no, nothing too crazy. But um, last year in Colombia, I got uh, my chain snatched from me. So that was okay. that was a that was a different one. Like I went to uh, I got I went out early in the the race program or whatever. So we went to some local spot to get some food, and I was with a bunch of BMXers. So I felt like I was in a decently safe area, but yeah, somebody came up from behind me and snatched my chain and hopped on a dirt bike and Get they were gone. Here. So it was the first time. I mean, luckily nothing like crazy happened, but I definitely felt super vulnerable in that country for the rest of the time <laughs> I was there. Cause I'm like, there's just no way that like this happened. Like this is actually <laughs> crazy. And, and like, we had like, we had meetings and, you know, on those types of trips, the team orchestrates meetings and we have a decent amount of security around us at all times while you're in the event um so it was really my fault but i definitely <laughs> didn't think that like me going to the local little taco joint right outside of the venue i was gonna be able to get taken advantage of but i but i was That's um, wild. other than that i've i mean some some bikes normally come delayed just because there's so many at one time but no other horror stories other than that have you ever had to use somebody else's bike other than yours for a big race <laughs> Um, not for a big race. Luckily this, this past year, actually in Rock Hill, I, um, I broke my hub in the semi and we have to do those B mains if we want, um, points. So I rode my old teammate Anthony's bike, um, and had some fun <laughs> on it. And like, and then like Rock Hills are pretty big track. So I'm like, Oh, I'm going to see if I can jump the berm jump still on his bike. And, but it, it was fine. But fortunately that's really been the only time where I've had to ride, you know, someone else's equipment other than like maybe someone's helmet. If, my helmet didn't make it or some clip shoes or something like that. But most of the time we travel with two bikes to try to prevent that. <clears throat> I was going to say, you guys, you have two bikes. So with two bikes, are they the exact same setup or do you do something a little different with the other one? Like, I don't, I changed the gear on this one. So that would have to go and do it. One's a 45, 44, you know, like. Yeah. So like that? when I go to the actual race, my bikes are set up um, the, ver the same. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like right now my bikes have two different gears on them. So like one will be, whether it's a training gear or if I'm just testing something, if I want, you know, a 44 or a 45, like you mentioned, or if I wanted to try a 50, um, one bike is kind of the one that I'll work on more. And then I'll leave one that's just completely race set up. So then that kind of becomes my race bike. And then I'll bring the spare when it's time to go. I'll make sure both gears are ready, whatever that one is. That way, if I get a flat tire or I break a stem or anything, it's just a complete easy swap over and I'm good to go. So what gearing do you normally run? Uh, so on a small hill, I normally run a 4416. And on the big hill, I'll probably run a 47. Hmm. A 4716? 4717. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's about, it's about the same ratio, but okay. um, they, they feel a little bit different to me. So. And so what is the training gear then? Um, so sometimes uh, it's all over the place. Sometimes it can be a hard gear. Sometimes it'll be an easy gear. Um, it just kind of depends on what my coach has me do. So like right now, you know, I'm trying to build a little more strength just because we had a little bit of time, which I mean, now the first race of the season is already in two weeks. So it's almost over. Uh, so like right now in particular, they're on a harder gear versus an easy gear. 
Um, but during the season, it kind of just changes all the time. So with the harder gear, would you just do everything on that? Like do sprints, do track work, do just... Um, I normally don't do like gates on any other gear, but I've read, I've ridden the track or done sprints with both a harder gear and an easier gear. But I typically <laughs> will only do the gates on something that's in that realm of 44 or 47 or 46. I wouldn't ever do a hard gear just because I feel like you completely wrench your form. <laughs> Cause that's what I used to do as a kid. I rode a harder gear during the week and then threw on the lighter gear to race. And I mm -hmm. felt like it helped me. But when I came back, I was told not to do that. They just said, train on the gear that you're going to race with. And I just always heard that you're one of the first people that I heard that has like a training gear, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that I train like on a specific gear all the time. Like I, like I, for instance, what you're kind of explaining, I wouldn't normally do, but there might be like one session during a week that I have, a harder or an easier setup compared to my race gear. But I wouldn't do like, if I had say three track sessions in one week, I probably wouldn't have the harder gear on for every single track session. If that gotcha. makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. All right. And same thing with the easier. Okay. Oh, but, oh, so if you ever, if you ever, if you ever wonder why there's a pause between us, it's because me and him are both taking mental notes on, <laughs> yeah, yeah, guys. no, you're good. Because <laughs> we both each other, and like we'll we'll make eye contact. Like, are you getting that? We're gonna try that one. <laughs> no, nah, nah, you're good. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm here for you guys, and I'm, I'm willing to spill out whatever you guys want to know, other than the. So your your dad, your dad was a um factory dad. Yeah, very much so, very much so, and I honestly, um, you know, even even helping kids now or people that want to get help sometimes. I always have to kind of look at their factory dads and see how they are because sometimes I won't um, necessarily agree with some of those things. And then that's always a conversation of discussion, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I did. I did have very much. So had a factory dad. Cool. Did he do, did he do your bike work or did he teach you how to do your own bike work? Um, He, he did most of the, the bike work, but he would always make me sit there at least. So I was always like, whether I was paying attention or not, <laughs> kind of here and there and like sometimes he would test me like oh what do you do with this and i'd be like uh. <laughs> but uh he, he would never let me touch it but he he would for sure have me <laughs> at least hanging out in the garage or being there to to at least look and kind of know and then i think around like like i had one one uh instance when i was like 12 i went to a race in florida with just my mom mm -hmm. and I had lost, well, I didn't even lose it, but it was in the bike bag. We, we didn't find it. And it was like a head headset cap or headset, little, the little shim, mm -hmm. um, completely didn't know anything about it. Put the bars on bars, wouldn't move. Mm. Um, and that was the one trip that when I got home, I was let know that I need to know how to work on my bike. Uh, <laughs> and then, and, and since then I've, I've been able to work on my bike. <laughs> no to say that. <laughs> so did your dad ever race? Uh, no. Did you ever want him to? Um, I think when I was either crying because I thought I was working too hard or throwing up after a sprint session or, you know, something like that, I always wanted him to just to like feel what I was feeling because, you know, I feel like it's, there's a pro and con with that, right? Like there's a, there's a spot where the parent is pushing your kid to our limits, which we think are our limits, which really aren't most of the time, but, you know, pushing your kid, to be right. better. And then also maybe not understanding exactly what's going on. And so I feel like I wanted him to race just because of that, because like there'd be times where I would do a bunch of full laps in a row and I would be like dead. And he's like, I don't understand why you're dead. It's 30 <laughs> seconds. And you're like, well, why don't you get on your bike? You know what I mean? So I feel like for that instance, yeah, but I don't think I ever really cared to, you know, see him compete or anything like that. Did you ever line up with your mom? Um, no, not anything like that. I think he <laughs> maybe, maybe came out to the track like once or twice on like a, like if the local track had a mom son race or something like on mother's day or something, okay. she, she kind of blows around. She gives me a hard time sometimes that I don't have a bike available for her to ride when I like come <laughs> home and stuff, but I, I don't know if she'd actually ride it. I think she just says it. <laughs> Did you ever race cruiser? Um, no, I was never allowed to race cruiser. Wow. Yeah, it was. At, and I think it's a little more competitive now, but at the time when I was growing up and getting into there, Cruiser kind of was looked at as maybe not this so important class. 
and I would just do open in class. And, and maybe maybe that wasn't the direct reason, but it also could have either been because maybe they didn't want to buy another bike or because they felt like going from one wheel to the other wheel would have made a big difference. I remember I rode a cruiser one time and I went to manual and I hit my butt on the tire and ate it. And that was the only, I've only ridden a cruiser one time, one, one time. Really? And, yep. One time. And it was in practice. Like it was like, Oh, my buddy has a cruiser. You want to ride it? I was like, my dad le- never let me do this when I was growing up. Heck yeah. I want to hop on your cruiser. Went on the cruiser. Went to do a double manual, oh my hit my God. butt over the bars. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, that's why they have the butt protectors now. Yeah. All the old, all the old guys use them, especially. Yeah. Have, so, what about any other style of bikes? Road bikes, mountain bikes, dirt jumpers. Did you ever yeah, get so, park and freestyle stuff? Or? Yeah. So that's honestly where a lot of my passion for BMX came from. Like, I grew up, you know, in the neighborhood riding my bike. Um, go into little miscellaneous dirt spots where they're building new houses or maybe a new gas station, bringing shovels, sneaking them in there, building a lip and jumping as far as you can. You know, we had, nope. um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot to do in Bakersfield. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been there or familiar with the area, but there's just kind of dirt. Yeah. And yeah. So like, <laughs> like I, like growing up, like my parents would give me 20 bucks and that would last me for like three, four days during the summer. We would just go to McDonald's, get a, cheeseburger and a sweet tea and hit this spot ride to this dirt jumps right spend the night at this guy's house um i never really got into the tricks and stuff at the skate park because honestly realistically everybody that was at the skate park was smoking dope but we you know were, <laughs> oh, were <what>? doing <laughs> we were doing uh yeah our own jumps um like i said a lot of it was i had some friends that were in new neighborhoods so we would go build one summer we'd have jumps the next summer they'd get torn down and then the next summer we would go to the park and then build jumps um and so yeah i i grew up riding those like dirt jumpers um park bikes type of thing but i never really got into freestyle okay so i've I've watched um and i think like caroline buchanan she might have done it before i know drew polk i've seen him do dual slalom before that looks really cool would that be ever something that you would possibly be interested in doing yeah, I, I think it's really cool too. Um, I'd say if you asked me that a few years ago, I might've said, yeah. Um, but now I don't think that I would have the same excitement for that as I, as I would have a few years ago. I think that even that type of riding takes a different type of skill that I feel like would be very challenging mentally to like hop right into. And if you're not good, then you kind of have to be like, okay, well, like, how much is, how long is this going to take me to be decent at? Um, I think I would do it for fun, but I'm not sure you could, you would see me at a dual solemn competition. I think I'm a little <laughs> too competitive to, to do that. And then with that, there's, there are big cruiser wheels. So I'd probably loop out and hit my butt on the tire too. <laughs> so I've watched some of those downhill races and those guys are insane. Right. But then That's I watched the, the dual slalom guys are also, but that was more like BMX, you know, to me, you know, and I was like, that is cool, man. That's cool. Yeah. I, um, a few, like growing up during the summer, we maybe would go to like the mountains and I would like rent a mountain bike and stuff and would ride them a few times. And they're, they're really fun. I don't know like how fast I would be able to go, but actually jumping the trails and not pedaling as much as we do. It was, it was kind of nice. Do you, do you know the top speed that you ever got on your BMX bike? Um, I think, I think it would be safe to say around 38 somewhere around there. Like going going down that supercross hill, especially like if there's no wind or there's tailwind, and you have like your best gait and you're going on the jumps, you can get you can get just under forty, I think. Were you were you at um, Rock Hill right before uh, Grands? Yeah, I was. So wasn't the sun kind of crazy on Sunday? How yeah, <laughs> yeah. They um, it's not their fault, but the time of the year <laughs> with that track. Man, and even in we, – we had a race at the beginning of the year in Oldsmar that was pretty brutal as well. We're like – we're kind of like, dude, like, come on. Like, I don't know if I can, can right. do this, but, I mean, it's the same for everybody, so. I, I know I went over there, and I went to the one of the tents, and I saw Johnny Vance over there, and I was like, dude, what visor is going to work for me where I can actually see the track? So he's kind of breaking down, like, the glares on everything, and I was like, okay, okay. And I was like, how much are these? He's like, these ones are, like, 300. So how much are these ones? He's like, I think those ones are like 150. I said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll be back. 
<laughs> I'll be back. I'm just gonna start blinking. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Like, yeah, yeah. Man, like that sun was brutal on Sunday. It's like you look and then you're just like you're trying to find something. And, one of the ladies and, and on our team that yeah, that's an extra like variable racing that day, you know? Like you had to be very and that and that's I think even something that is just different with experience. Like I went into that race knowing, okay, hey, I'm not gonna be able to push as hard into the turns because I'd rather be safe and make it to the finish line than maybe go gung ho and hope. <laughs> Right. Um, whereas right. some kids are just either full throttle or they just don't even think about those things. Um, I, although 24 is not super old, I, now that I'm kind of in the mid of my <laughs> pro career, I kind of know when to, when to hold them, when to fold them. So I, uh, that day ex- specifically, I was like, all right, let's get to the first turn, <laughs> see where we're at. If you know, we're competitive, we're competitive. And if not today, it might not be our day. Cause I'm not jumping into a dark ray of abyss. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you have a routine when you're entering the gate? Like when you're in staging, are you loose? Yeah. Are you like super focused? How are you? Yeah. So um, I think it's changed over the years, but what I actually try to do is put myself in a more um, like a more pressured situation in practice so that the race doesn't feel as bad. Um, and so I do have the same kind of, um, you know, thing going on when I get into the gate but it can kind of also be different just depending on the scenario like kind of what my job and my task is at that one moment so like no matter what you kind of already know what kind of and especially in pro like you know what gate you're in you know like if you're on a couple points or not on points or you know you have to get out or like basically what I'm saying is I think the the mind the the mental space in every gate is the same but I think the steps leading up to that could be different depending on what time of day it is. Um, but I, I really don't do anything too, too special. Like I visualize the lap, um, how I want to do it. I have keywords, which is something that my coach worked on me with many, many years ago that I just do. I say a few things to myself. I say a little prayer, I get in and then my gate routine is always kind of the same. Um, and then, yeah, like over, I guess the past like year and a half, it's honestly gotten a little bit more lax, but I think that just comes kind of from confidence um, versus like when I was, you know, 18, I had everything down to a T exactly how I wanted to do it. And then if it didn't go right, I was like, so screwed because I, I wasn't expecting, you know what I mean? I wasn't prepared for that. So I think like now I've trained my brain to kind of be a little bit more lax, not, you know, off, off par by any means, but more accepting of like everything that could happen and not being so, okay, it has to be like this and it's got to work like this because if not, there's no other way. I'm kind of like, all right, kind of bring everything up to it, get in the gate, do your thing. And then, you know, after you get out of the gate, then you figure, you know, then you kind of figure out what you're going to do because obviously there's a million different things you can't control, you know, that happen from the gate, even to the 30 foot line, you know, somebody flinching, the pause being long, somebody dropped their clip shoe, somebody cut you off. You know, there's just so many different things that, um happen after the gate that i feel like some people may almost ruin their chances you know before they even step in it so do you listen for the beep or are you watching the lights at the gate (laughs) this is actually a really funny question i've I've been back and forth a whole cycle now growing up i watched the light always um and then i felt like when i got onto the supercross hill at like 17 if i was in like gate four or five i'd look too far one way or the other trying to look at the light and it would make me come out of the gate crooked. So then I started listening and I listened for two years. And then this past year I started looking at the light again. And I did that because of reaction time. I think that watch you, you see before you hear. So. So I've, I've tried it. Somebody told me try watching the lights and I'm just, I keep hitting the gate. I, okay. I just way too fast on it. And I'm just right. like, what am I doing, bro? Like, I just know that is good, probably watching the light because I'm getting out right. quicker, but it's a little too quick. And I think I need to either lean back or just pause for a second. Or... Yeah, it, it probably has to do like with, um, yeah, the form more so because you can actually delay how fast you get out of the gate with a higher or a lower pedal. So I feel like the reaction stuff is kind of personal. Like I know great starters who listen and I know great starters that watch the light. And at the end of the day, they, they both won races, but 
those other things, you know, can be solved with different tactics. It's also another question. How mentally do you deal with like somebody crashing in the motor before you and they're just like out in the track for the next 15 minutes? You're sitting on the gate. I mean, you're ready to go, bro. You know, and then you just got to sit and wait. Yeah. um, You know, a thing that I kind of have come to is like almost putting it in the way of like everybody's dealing with the same thing. So how can I just make this the best case scenario for me? Like, so before we're growing up, I would be like, Oh man, same thing. Oh, waiting here, waiting here, waiting here. Then I'd get in the gate and have a super late gate or a super bad lap. Cause I wasn't mentally in it. And now I kind of try to use those things for like, um, almost a little bit of an edge. Right. I'm like, okay, somebody's down, you know, obviously hope they're okay. But like, Hey, how many people are nervous right now? Okay, cool. Like let's, let's use this to our advantage. And, and a good example, um, was the, the Pan American, uh, race that I, I won in October, we sat on the gate for probably, well, it felt like, <laughs> felt like two minutes, but probably like 30 seconds of just sitting there before they even clicked the button. And in that 30 seconds, I had so much time to think, but like, all I thought was like, oh, everybody's nervous right now. Like, this is perfect. Like no one else, because, because obviously you don't, you don't practice that. You don't practice sitting on the gate at your local track and waiting however long for someone to go unless someone obviously does crash at your practice. But I think again, in those moments are kind of when I try to turn my brain into how can I make this better for me versus how can I let this affect me? Man, I hope I remember that. That is a jewel, bro. Like really. <laughs> right. Right. Cause I know when like we were up there and like, you see somebody like go down in front of us and I look over there and it makes me like completely reevaluate my life and what I'm doing <laughs> yeah. right now. I'm just yeah. Like, or another, or another much. writer says something to you on the gate, like, dang, that's crazy. Or do you see that? And like, yeah. not that they're trying to get in your head, but that stuff just does get in your head. Like we're human. Right. Like you hear things, you see things and all of a sudden you're like, dang, what? And then they're like, Oh, here we go. And you're like, Oh, <laughs> you're like, no, there they go. How do I lock my hold this one out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you have one race that you wish you could do over? Um, honestly, no. I think that um, every race has led me to exactly where I need to be. Um, awesome. I think I think there would be too many if I said yes. <laughs> Any race that I didn't win. <laughs> Got you. Good answer. How is um? How important is mental health in this game? Man, it's, it's more important than physical, to be completely honest, because um, like we had mentioned a little bit earlier, like trying to find balance in life is important, but also kind of realizing that, um, you know, your self-identity and, you know, your self-worth isn't based off of a result, I think is important. And then also as an athlete, as, a, and as anybody, um, I think it's really easy to be your hardest critic um so i think for both cases in that sense um mental health is is huge and i think that um you know if i didn't get help because i have gotten help with psychologists and sports psychs and stuff like that i feel like my career would be a lot shorter than you know maybe it will be when this is all said and done um because i was able to you know get help or at least talk to somebody about those things because um, major. I think, yeah. And I think I, I, just touching back on it, cause it is, it does mean a lot to me. Like that's that pivotal age of like 16, 17, 18, when these kids are chasing these nag titles and these national titles and these race wins, right? Like at that moment in time, it feels like everything to you. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously as adults and people that are distant from the sport, you know, they know, understand that there's more to life than a BMX race, but sometimes you do get into that zone that no one's going to be able to take you out of and I think it's really important to kind of find a a place in your life where you feel that you know you race BMX because you like it and it's fun and you're competitive and you want to win but at the end of the day you know your life isn't all that bad if you don't get that result that you want or you know you don't you know correct and I think that it's very very easy to talk about if you haven't been through it but being like going through it and kind of having that realization and now kind of being where I'm at now, you know, I wish somebody could have showed me that in a different way. I wish I didn't have to go through the things that I went through to get there, but overall I'm a better, you know, person, athlete, rider, because, um, you know, I've I've kind of found myself not needing, you know, these results or these titles to make me happy as a person. Right. 
You know, I was going to say a lot has to do with your mentors and the people that you look up to, you know, and how they're going to respond to you losing. You know, I've seen parents like totally chew their kids out for losing. So like they right. think, yeah, if they lose, it is the end of the world because their dad is going to probably. Yep. Who knows what? I, I went through the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I think that that's something that unfortunately not everybody can control. Um, but at the same time, I just I hope that you know, everybody, yeah, does have a good mentor or somebody that they feel like they can talk to to kind of get you through that. And I don't know how much time we have here, but my coach no, is a, a big um, influence in my life because of that. Um, my coach is Ariel Martin, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with her story, but she was, she was and made the Olympic team in 2012. And she, you know, had done all the hard work, right? All, everything to get there, made, done the results, got this, got, did everything she had to do. And the track session before, or one of the track sessions before they were going to leave for London, um, her chain derailed and she like lacerated her kidney um, and had to get airlifted and the whole nine yards. And so long story short, um, she almost died. Luckily she didn't. Um, But what I was able to learn from her, from her experience kind of was that the results don't mean everything to you because at that time in her life, like that was everything, right? Like, My whole dream is to go to the Olympics. I want to be an Olympian. I've worked my butt off to be here. I deserve to be here. So you feel right. I don't, regardless of religion or the upper power you believe in, you know, you kind of feel like some things are owed to you. And she just plain and simple, she didn't get to go and she didn't get to compete. And she, yeah, didn't get to race a race that she qualified for and did. And within that, you know, she had to do a lot of soul searching and, you know, going through those things that were way harder than any of the things that I've had to go through on that side of things. And so, you know, having her in my corner, she was kind of almost able to, to shove me in a direction to kind of learn that younger because, you know, she learned that in the later part of her career. And so, you know, she made it a big point for me to know and understand these kind of things before I get there, before there is a, you know, a big breaking point, which unfortunately for her, you know, was probably more major than anybody would prey on or hope that, someone would have to learn a lesson, but for whatever reason, um, you know, that's led her to be, I mean, obviously she was able to recover and do amazing things after that. But I think that her story was a big eye opener for me to kind of realize like, Hey, like, you know, you can have a dream, you can have a goal, you can work hard for it every day, but also again, the result doesn't, you know, decide who you are as a person, but also like nothing in this sport is owed to you. So if you tie yourself too tight to it, you know, it can, fight back and you know you don't want to be in a a lost place when this is all said and done you know right so hey because i i use it as therapy and and i know a lot of other guys do too you know i mean i could have a totally shit day and i go to the track and then i don't even remember why my day was shit it's bro like uh, why was i mad you know like i'm totally happy right now i'm at the track i'm racing or i'm riding you know so i definitely yeah i think and i think that's what this this sport is so good for right like you can take it as serious or as lax as you want it. And it can be, you know, beneficial in all those different ways. It can give you your therapy. It can give you your exercise. It can, you know, depending on how hard you want to get into it, you know, it can make you have discipline. It can show you camaraderie. It can show you competition. You know, you know, you can be the guy who's just going to the track and using it for, like I said, for that therapy, or you can, you know, also be on the other side and try to be a professional athlete and, do all those things. And I think that's like, at the end of the day, I think that's what's so great about our sport is that you have that decision, right? Like you don't have to be this guy that's going to play in football. And once you get out of football in high school, you either have to go to college to go to the NFL or you got to stop, right? Like BMX, you can be, you know, there's, there's a 60 and over class. You know what I mean? Like there's no 60 year olds playing football. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, because, because that's just not, how those sports are designed. So I think we're very fortunate to be in a sport that, you know, kind of allows us to do that. And I've said that, I said, this is the only sport where I've seen 50 and 60 year old men come, I mean, fresh, not knowing a thing about BMX. I mean, next thing you know, they're at the track, they got a brand new bike, they got a helmet. Yep. They're like, man, I'm <laughs> going to do this, bro. Like, I, you know, cause they see other older guys out there doing it and it looks so fun and we're in shape and, you know, they see the, the camaraderie and they see the families that, that show up, yep. and, you know, It's just such a cool environment to be around. It always has been, you know. When I was a kid and I wanted to quit, my mother was like, what am I going to do? 
Like, what, what am I yeah. going to do now? You know, like all my friends are at the track. Like that, that was our life, you know? Right. Yes. Yeah. Who's, who's your favorite vet pro? Oh, my favorite vet pro. Um, I'm a, this will be, this will be biased, but I'm a big Nick Long fan for what he's kind of the direction that he's been able to change his like mental. I, I didn't really know him very well as he was a pro, but I think right. it's been cool to see someone like him who has been obviously at the pinnacle of the sport kind of lash back and be just so BMX infused because right. I feel like that's a pretty big challenge, right? Like, and I'm, and I'm not even throwing any shade, but there's a lot of people who race at the pinnacle of the sport that as soon as they're done, they've had enough and they could care less, right? Like right. you don't see a lot of um, retired pros still, you know, giving that much back to the sport. And I think, um, you know, he's a pivotal guy right now in our sport and, you know, he's doing a lot to try to change um, the trajectory of the sport, which means a lot. Let me ask you this. Do you think if he were to clip in, he would dust everybody? <laughs> um i don't know i think that i think that maybe by now barry would probably give him a run for his money um but i feel like maybe last year or the year, i don't know how long he's been vet but i feel like year year one like if he only did flats for six months and then clip back in i think he would be very very competitive i think for sure um on a small hill like not a five meter hill like i don't know if there's anybody touching him on one of those, but I feel like the bigger tracks, you know, some of the other guys do have skills as well. So I don't know. I think it would be a good race. Who was your, now who was your, um, who was your go-to growing up that you always looked up to? Yeah, my, my favorite rider was Donnie Robinson. Always. Um, he was, so I'm from California. He was up obviously NorCal-ish, but he gave me hope because of how small he was. And I noticed that no matter what, and obviously there's a lot of athletes and a lot of BMXers that didn't do it either, but there hasn't been a time in my mind where I saw him quit, whether mm -hmm. he was in sixth place, whether he was in seventh place in the semi, he went to the finish line, not saying he went his hardest and he pushed out there, you know, but what I always noticed for him as a kid was like, yo, that guy's head is below everybody's shoulders. And, um, you know, and he was always, always trying, you know, and that's kind of where, and, and kind of what I always wanted to do. And especially when I kind of got to the age of like knowing where maybe I would have some impact on some people younger than me was I knew that like those two values stuck out to me, like the guy that never quit. And, you know, the guy that whether it was perseverance or defied some odds of being smaller or whatever, I feel like those, those things gave me hope because there isn't a lot of people like that out there. So Donnie was always my go-to. Yeah, that was me also. I was always looking for the smaller guys. Like, yo, there's a small guy. Yeah, there, or man. just just root for him. Like, hey, he's doing it. I know. <laughs> it's possible. It's, funny. It, oh, oh, yeah. it's funny that's how it is because I was always the, the heavy set kid. So my guys were always like Frank Thomas for like baseball and just, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, Reg yeah, White yeah. and the fridge. I, these, like, I'm like, yeah, look at the big guys out there. Like, yep. Yeah, so. it's it's inspiring, right? And it gives right. you that sense of hope that maybe you don't need the hope, but it's always good to see, right? Like yeah. it's always good to see somebody that is in a similar situation, or maybe you think they are like doing what yep. you want to do. Yeah. And he probably inspires more people than I do, you know, because there's a lot of older guys that are bigger, you know, and they're like, oh, hold on, man, this guy's on a bike too. I've seen it. You know, I've seen guys point out the big guy on the track and say, look how big that guy is, bro. Like, you know, I could do it too. Sure right. enough, oh, I get on the bike. Like, dude, I, I call them out. Like usually, if I'm walking by and I see them with their kids, I'll be like, "Where's your bike? Let's go." They're like, "What?" And I'm like, "You see me with mine? You look like I'm good at it. Let's go. What you doing? Get your bike." Yeah, and let's they're just go. like, oh, "I don't know." And I'm like, "Come on, man. You know it's fun out there." So, I mean, and and we're always talking about how we can get more people into the sport. I mean, we love the sport so much. We want everybody to ride. You know, right? I mean, I, I, what do you? What's your suggestion on how we could make this sport a little more? You know, just yeah, I mean, I think that uh, USA BMX has started with their foundation to try to help that um, transition. But um, when I was on, I was on a, a junior development team um, in, a few years ago, and Dale Holmes ran that um, along with Jamie Staff. But Dale Holmes does a really good job with the grassroots um, types of things, mm -hmm. and he somehow got his 
brand or whatever into YMCA programs. Nice. Um, and so over the summer, when kids are able to pick sports, you know, BMX was an option. And really, you know, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's in, he's in San Diego. He does it with Tyler Brown a lot. Not Tyler Brown doesn't do it, but he uses Tyler Brown's track. Um, and obviously Tyler Brown's are a big impact to that, to that local community as well. But I think that that was the first time that I saw a way for BMX to kind of get in to, you know, household things. Um, because yeah, like your summer camp, you know, there's basketball, there's football, there's baseball, and that's typically it. And, right. you know, for BMX to be a part of that, I think that that's a very small step that would make, you know, a big impact. And so, like I said, I think USA BMX is in the process or they are doing it. I'm not, excuse my ignorance, but I'm not super, super um, up to date with what they're doing. But I do know that they run programs through the schools, at least locally in Oklahoma and they're I think they're starting it there and maybe wow. I'm assuming we'll expand that but kind of just getting getting bikes in front of people's faces you know where it wouldn't be because truthfully like I feel like if you gave a kid the decision to play a stick and ball sport or throw a bike in front of them I think they probably would pick a bike most of them right. I feel like would but sometimes because that's not even an option it doesn't get thought of um and then you know they're out of there and so i think even like um just other people doing good for the sport like i know that mongoose has really nice level or entry level um bikes that are available haro does that as well i think i'm not sure if dk does it anymore but redline was a, a you know thing because i think another thing that and i'm kind of rambling here but i think another thing that's hard is the entry level price Right. I was I was just going to touch on that also. And, and knowing that I so your family knew about BMX already. So they already knew what they were getting into. I see right. some of these families have no idea. And then once they realize they're like, oh, my God. And sometimes it's too late. The kids already hooked like they're going to do whatever they want to do for little Johnny. So he could race and they're right. dumping all this money into it, you know, when they probably don't have to because you could race and race on an entry level bike, get really Correct. good, move up, you know. But they get to the track and they see the guys that are winning got carbon forks, carbon wheels. So now they got to get yeah. their kid carbon forks and carbon wheels. And now they're making yeah, it. And, so, and, and, and that's kind of what I feel like Dale did really well with his program was he kind of did. It was like BMX Pro for a week was the, is the name of it or whatever. And so during the week, because I, I had to work some of them with, with my team deal, like that was kind of one of those things, which I had a great time doing it. But during that week, you would get a kid who has never ridden a bike before and would get him on the bike. He learned how to do to get on his bike and, and ride. First of all, you know, we would teach them, you know, the do's and don'ts, you know, don't put your fingers near the chain. You know, if your handlebars get twisted around, twist them back up, pedals level, kind of the entry stuff. And throughout that whole entire week, you'd get a kid from maybe who had never ridden a bike to, they would actually put them at the end. And I'm not sure it was a sanctioned race, but they would let the kids race on the last day the parents could come and that was the day for the parents to ask questions you know how can i do this how can i do that and i think it worked or it works well in that community because then tyler runs the track and has rental bikes and stuff and so sometimes parents are able to go to the track rent a bike mm -hmm. and have them kid race so maybe for you know 35 bucks instead of 15 bucks they're able to to race and compete and then obviously they've got to hope that they can come back and ride the same bike every time, but at least that's a step to kind of make them not have to do that initial investment and almost let little Johnny race for a month or two um, mm -hmm. and try it. Because I, at the same time, like if your kid's going to do baseball, you're still buying him cleats. You're still buying him a bat. You're still buying him a bag. You know, the kid needs a helmet, a yep. glove. Like they're still spending that initial probably three to $700 to get the kid into it. Um, but I, I will say, I, I do think that that's intimidating when you see obviously a kid with a carbon fiber frame at seven and the other kids riding this <laughs> Walmart bike. They're like, Oh, I'm not going to be able to afford that anytime soon. So we might as well not even try. Right. But I love when I see the kids with the stock bikes coming to the track and whipping those kids. You know? Absolutely. And, yeah. And their dad's looking at their kid like, bro, I just bought you a $3,000 bike. You better win, you know? You better. <laughs> and it's yep. not the bike, bro. I keep telling them it's not the bike, man. Yep. Absolutely. How, how, I forgot to, um, how old were you when you went to your first grants? I was eight. You were eight. And you've been going like every year ever since, pretty much? Yeah, pretty much. So I, I, 
took time off from 13 to 15. So I went probably 8, 9, 10, 11, and then probably missed out 12, 13, 14, 15, and then started back again at 16. So pretty much. I've, I've been to a couple, but I haven't been to all of them. Was it always electrifying to be there, or was it something that once you got older, you're just like, whoa? No, nah, man, the Grands is always is the one <laughs> that you, you want to do. I think. I've never been, so that's why I'm always okay. like, I, I hear about it, and Shannon's gone. Like, he's just like, it's a whole nother level of just like man, it's, it's, in that building. It's, it's literally like Christmas when you were five every <laughs> single year, even though like just from the whole buildup, obviously with the, the, the atmosphere, I think what – is super funny that I've realized is like I used to go like going it used to actually not be a thing I would look forward to because it meant it was a lot of pressure right. um you know especially with factory dads you know <laughs> they spend all this money all season long right. they're expecting a nag plate and if you don't make that main event as a kid like your whole week is or your whole year almost seems like it's for nothing and I think right. it's been nice like as I've gotten older and even racing pro like not that you're not in charge of your own fate back then, but I don't feel like the season is weighed as heavy on that result, right? Like I've ha- I've gone to Grands as a pro and done well. Um, mm-hmm. This last year was well for me as as well, but like last year I didn't do very well at the Grands, and like it didn't hurt as bad as maybe when I was you know 15, and you know you have these nag points and you have all these people that you haven't raced all year, and you go to this one race and it's literally one you're one lap away from your whole year being nothing to some right. people. Right. Um, I think that causes a lot of stress. And so I feel like I have a new appreciation um, for the grands now, like kind of just being a pro, but I think no matter what, it's always to me, like one of the biggest races that I always like want to do well at. I think that it's, it's easily top four, even putting all the races up there on a, on a list. I think the grands is going to be in anybody's top four or five for sure. Right. Right. I, I know it sucks for the riders when it comes down to one lap at the end of the year. You know, but yeah. it makes it so exciting for us watching it. You know? I know, even, <laughs> even 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 I watched most like really all of the expert girl and expert uh, boys mains. Like I even still watched it on Sunday, like back home, because it still intrigues me. I might not keep up through all, the whole season, but I do enjoy watching the competition, kind of watching how some kids will be able to come through. You know, it, it seems like a lot of the kids, you know, if there's a one winner, there's always a lot of they can kind of repeat the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also cool seeing, you know, the people that you wouldn't expect to win come out and win. And, right. you know, I know it means a lot to them. Cool. I'm, so what's your um? So what is your meal prep going into a national? Do you change anything? Um, I don't I don't change anything too crazy. No, I think the only thing that I do. Um, on a weekly basis that I wouldn't do close to the, closer to the race is eat red meat. Um, I don't know the exact science behind it, but I know it takes your body a little longer to digest that stuff. So I just get told not to, but typically like I'm eating the same types of things. I'm eating a protein source. I'm eating rice and I'm typically trying to get some fruits and vegetables in there. Mm -hmm. Um, during the race, actually, I do a lot of like simple sugars. So I'll have like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen those little like applesauce packets so like during like for instance during the the grands main events at night when they're all kind of close together like i'm not gonna i'm not really a big foodie during the race so i'm not gonna be able to eat like a peanut butter honey sandwich or anything like that so like i'll finish the race put a little like corner of a protein bar in my mouth and then suck up the um applesauce to give me some sugar and kind of put that throughout the day but if we're like doing a traditional race that's spread out through that long time. I still try to hit those three big meals as best as I can and almost overdo them. So like if I know, Hey, like the race starts at 1130 and I'm not going to race until 12, I'm either going to eat early and then eat again, like eat an early breakfast at say seven and then eat again at 1030 and then let my body take that hour and a half to kind of digest or I'll wait super, super long and just eat at the 10, 30, 11, that one time and try to get it as close as I can to the race without like, you know, right. eating something throughout the entire day. Cause I'll, I'll throw up even if it's not like I'm in shape or not. My body just doesn't really do too well with that. Okay. So no cheeseburgers in between motos. No, I wish. I feel like honestly, like I probably could, I just feel like it would make me feel like crap. <laughs> 
Ask I mean, everybody. it works. For, it, it works for some. It works for some. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, I was like, like, like what are you, like, what are you eating right it. now? And I'm like, I got a double cheeseburger, some nachos, <laughs> the Sprite. Yeah. I was doing. Like, yeah, so like, 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 even, even, even funny story. Like, I know that I'll do an applesauce or whatever, but like, I know Joris will eat Skittles if he needs simple sugar. And like, yeah. some people's parents are like, "Oh, you're not having Skittles," but like, sometimes like you just gotta get in whatever you can get in, and whether it's. Yeah really that good for you or not in that moment you're burning all those calories anyways and your body's just exerting energy so you kind of just give it whatever it needs and if it is a cheeseburger then hey so be it you know what i mean i'm i'm not I, one to judge i just started getting on to the skittles too like i noticed it's almost like it um takes the fear out of me i, I eat the skittles <laughs> right before i go and okay. the sugar rush makes my eyeball pop and i'm like there you go all right let's go like i'm ready to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it today. And they're just like, no, you're not. Relax. Have you, have you guys <laughs> experienced with caffeine or no? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He has. Yeah, yeah. Ca- caffeine will make you go, too. You got to be careful with it, but caffeine can make you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I slept. I don't think after after the grands, I don't think I slept all night because I was that juiced up in caffeine and adrenaline. So, <laughs> I got to try some of that Cuban coffee before I race one day, man. That stuff gets you going, bro. Man. Have you uh, you guys friends with Jeff Upshaw? Yeah. yeah you should ask him about, about his time trial in Manchester. He had a little bit too much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we got to make sure to ask him about it. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we – yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might so, not want to talk about it. What's your favorite yeah, movie? Not. Uh, favorite movie. I'm into comedy stuff. So I really like enjoy like the 21, 22 jump streets. I think those mm-hmm. are funny. Uh, the hangovers are funny to me. Um, if I'm going to watch a movie, um, like I said, it's going to be comedy. Okay. Do you have a favorite comedian? Uh, no, not really. I think just those types of movies, no, nothing in particular. What kind of music do you listen to? I'm um, kind of all over the place, but if I like, for hype up and just for chill, I really like country music. Um, I just think that it's 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 really good. And then I um, I listen to rap, and then I also listen to like reggaeton, which is like kind of like South American, like little like not dancing music, but stuff right. with good beats and kind of just yeah keeps the vibes good. So it it just kind of depends what mood I'm in. I mean I've listened to hardcore rap where I felt like I was ready to get down with it before I'm in, and I've also listened to taylor swift before a main event it kind of just depends on what (laughs) kind of what mental space i'm in if i need to calm down or if i feel like i need to get hyped or you know whatever but uh, yeah my my music taste is pretty broad have you ever been to a race where they played music during the race yeah they they do it in in south america a lot actually yeah i've seen some nationals down there and they also do it in there was the british national championship i think they were playing music during the motos so that's pretty sick as soon as the gate drops, the music plays. You know, it's like when they're in the gate, it's quiet. You know, but as soon quiet. as the gate drops, but, but you know what's funny? Obviously, you guys know. Nine times out of ten, you don't even hear that when you're racing. <laughs> well, so, that, that's so usually weird. a question I ask. Do you? Can you hear what's going on? Do you hear the announcers or the crowd or? Yeah. So honestly, I use that the announcers in the crowd now as like um like track awareness. So yeah, yeah. I listen. So like if I know. Say I get the whole shot and I know a certain rider's behind me versus another one. I kind of already know how these types of people race. So depending on who I hear behind me or like, obviously you can hear hubs or whatever. Um, that'll be kind of the direction that I ride or this way, that way. I mean, I can't always do it. There's been times where someone is way closer than I thought they were and I get past. And there's also been times where I'm trying my butt off, making a bunch of mistakes and I'm, you know, three bikes ahead. Um, so it doesn't always work, but yeah, I'm, I'm normally like in into the turns or like if there's a spot where you're jumping or kind of flowing and you can kind of pay attention. I, I tend to to listen to them for for cues. Yeah, yeah. If the announcer is good, he could let you know everything that's going on on the track. And it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I listen for all that, and I've always had. But um, with, with pros, they always announce the whole race you know with us sometimes right. they might be taking a coffee break or something like they might not right, they or, might or announce it's coming through, around the last start, turn or something yeah they, right. they start halfway right. through the turn yeah and i'll like like i'll say it like at the the pan american games like i had a pretty decent lead and i did not think i had that decent lead and i almost blew it because i was trying so hard because i didn't know 
what was going on. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. one of the, the basic rules of thumb is don't look back. You right. know what I mean? And, and sometimes, you know, that could be a, a, a big a big deciding factor in a race, right? Just knowing where you're at on the track, who's behind you. Like I said, what kind of racers behind you, if you know somebody is more likely or not to go stick it in there and go for an aggressive move, or if the person behind you is going to be okay with taking a second, that, that lap, like those are all things that, you know, are variables when it's all said and done. Right. And me, I'm turning around. I don't care. Like I'm old school. We used to do that. Like we'll turn like our head for just a second, you know, but probably not supposed to, but I, I still do it. Yeah. I don't yeah. remember. I don't remember where it was, but I'm pretty sure it was a UCI race where somebody had a whistle and was using the whistle when they were in the gate. And one of the pros like flipped over the gate because he hit the whistle right before the gate dropped. Yeah. Yeah. That was, and in, I was um, just, Argentina. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm talking about. Yep. And I kind of wanted to be like, with that doing that, so would they, do you think that they should have just like restarted that race? Yeah, so I think that they should have restarted it, but unfortunately, and it's really not anybody's fault, but the South Americans kind of just run what they brung. Like they're just right. living. Right. And so I think I think depending on where that race is located and how many people actually went to them and were like, yo, what the heck? We need a rerun. Like I think in USA BMX, they probably would have reran that. Right. Um, but in some countries, it's kind of just like, BMX race, it can happen. And, and and that whistle wasn't even necessarily anybody's fault. It's just that where the track is was in a sports complex where they were doing soccer. So the oh, refs, the refs oh, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? So it wasn't yeah. like there was somebody in the stands hitting the, waiting for the whistle. It was like, okay, well, this BMX race is going on. And whether it's the sports complex's fault or not, they're running a freaking soccer tournament. You know, well, that, two that's parking how, lots away. That's okay. how every, every you described it like somebody was on the side, like you know, Bro, hiding behind just, a bush or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The in, in, in the video, you just hear the the whistle. Yeah, you just hear the whistle. Well, so, but yeah. So, I was okay. just like, yo, because he just went straight over, boom, and I was like, that's wild. All right, yeah. When I was a kid, I raced at a track. There was a a dirt bike track right next to it, and then a mm-hmm. quarter mile. And sometimes they used to race like the the drags with the Jet engines, and those yep, things so, loud. The engines. So, so we'll we'll have to sit there like we could be on the gate, and they'll have to hold the gate for a few minutes, man, for the freaking jet engine cars to go down, and then we could race. Yeah, and and my <laughs> old local track, uh, Metro, has a big train next to it, so it would when the train is coming, they would always stop the gate because you never know if the train guy is just trying to be nice and hits the horn, right? And who knows? And and honestly, that train came by a lot of nationals, and they would do it, <laughs> and you're just like ah. Uh, but they don't know, you know what I mean. Right. So it's just kind right. of uncontrollables out there. That's funny. So I was gonna say, I'm, I'm surprised Shannon didn't mention this one. But when you were going over your story of certain neighborhoods and stuff, rough areas or whatever, but one of the tracks that Shannon went to when he was a kid, there was like literally a shooting while he was at the track. Oh dang! Really? Well, there was a there was a bingo place, like a building within that same facility. You know, so you had the track on the side, bingo building. And they had like a groups of guys that used to come up to gamble. It was a gambling spot also. So yeah. it was a bunch of people from like the city that took tour buses up to the spot. It was like a retreat, you know. Anyway, right. man, they had a freaking shootout. And my mom was just holding us down. We're ducking. I mean, it was just wild. I mean, people actually got shot, not from the track, but at the gambling But yeah, spot. nearby. Yeah, but I just great. remember seeing people running and hearing gunshots. I'm like, what is going on? So the, the article is still in the newspaper to this day. It's funny because I looked it up not too long ago. You know about the shooting it's just like wow bro <laughs> because yeah, there are crazy, some tracks man. that are in some sketchy areas like you know usually they are for some reason right absolutely and yeah and i wouldn't say that um my area was too at risk for that but in in bakersfield it's definitely not in the greatest area and there are um you know homeless and i mean we it's yeah, disrespectful, yeah. but we call it, we yeah. call them tweakers and yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. People, that are, <laughs> people that are stealing, hopping yep. in, yep. hopping over the fences, getting into the snack bars. And, you know, I've been to the track when the cars have gone broken into and someone's wife got their purse stolen Oh yeah, and yeah, and it's, it's right by the train track. So there's people hopping on the trains, hopping off the trains. Um, yeah. Bakersfield definitely has some sketchy areas, but um, I was kind of fortunate enough to not really ever get into anything like that we've we've gone to other races growing up like that have other kind of ran down areas in california that we would always have to be careful in um but fortunately i've never been a part of any anything too too hectic i think 
the city that I'm in, though, I've, I've seen I've seen some things, but I, I was never <laughs> like I was never with those type of people to get into anything too too crazy. But like like I said, Bakersfield is a pretty risky place to be. Yeah. So you mentioned tweakers. Have you ever raced any tweakers, man? Have you ever known any? <laughs> have you ever known any other riders to be like high while they were racing? Um, not not the like where I would have been old enough to know. Like I was pretty not street in tune until I was probably seventeen or eighteen. I'm sure there was kids, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, getting into stuff like that. But I was I was fortunate enough to grow up in a place where or I have a family that kept me very, very far away from that type of stuff. So I wouldn't have been able to, cool. um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to be like, oh, yeah, like that guy's high or like, oh, yeah, that guy's on something. But um, I I've, I've heard about, stories for sure. I mean, I'm, I was talking more about now, like as far as like the pros. <laughs> oh, against. No, it's, well, well, so <laughs> we're not able to like we get uh, like if, if you're on like the UCI, you get um, drug, you tested, get drug right? tested at any time. So um most of us have to be pretty clean so yeah I don't, I don't really know anybody that i mean i've heard stories of some people being on some sleeping pills and stuff after their big caffeines and obviously there's there's instances that happen i know of uh, one guy who got third at the national championships and then had to later give his medal up because he popped up um for being or having thc in his, in his system but nobody that i know on a day-to-day -day basis that i'm around is in any of that just because it's too risky yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's not helping your BMX racing. Yeah, I'm sure it's not. I mean, I've, I've honestly <laughs> heard that you know some some of that stuff does help, and maybe it would make you more calm. But yeah, it's too too risky, and and I'm not really uh, into any of that stuff. So I'll have a beer here or there, but other than that, it's it's pretty clean over here. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess my final question would be: when it's all said and done, what do you want to be remembered for in the sport? It's a great question. Um, I, I, I touched on it a little bit, but I just want to be remembered for uh, the kid that never gave up and, and always gave it his best effort. Um, I think when it's all said and done, you know, the impact you have on people is more important um, than the races. I think there's a lot of people in the past and even other athletes that um, have a lot of cool accolades, but people can just think, be like, ah, oh, that guy was super great, but he wasn't really a great person. Um, I never want to be remembered as someone that who wasn't a great person. Um, right. And yeah, just kind of, just kind of want to be a role model to kids to just never give up. Cause I think that growing up, um, you know, I was never, never the guy, right. I never want, I was never nagged one. Um, I was never, I, I did win wow. some races, but I was never up for the titles. I was never the person to get called on. You know, I went to the, you know, us development camps growing up and I never was like, that guy on the top three list of like, Oh yeah, these are the guys that are coming up. That's going to do it. You know, I, I very much so was just the guy that never quit. And I think that um, there have been, been people that have, like I said, had a lot more talent, had a lot more skill, maybe had better opportunities, but they ended up quitting for whatever reason. Um, and I think that, you know, so often, oftentimes people look at people maybe in my position and go, Oh, like that guy just must be, you know, a freak or that guy must be just crazy or he's lucky or he's blood, whatever that may be. And, and the truth of it is I just mm -hmm. was the person that didn't give up. So I think that would be the biggest thing. That's major right there. Usually that's awesome. who wins, right? Yeah. All right. Very cool, man. Thanks for coming by, man. We really appreciate this. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I appreciated the time and I'm, I'm always happy to share my story. So. All right. Thank you. Have a great, uh, wait, you're on West coast. Have a great <laughs> afternoon, <laughs> evening. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're good. Thank you guys. Right. Have a good night.